Man, that's Sunday good. That's Sunday morning good there, isn't it? Amen. <clears throat> well, welcome back to Sunday night on Mother's Day. How many of you got to eat lunch with your mama today? You know what? That's the first time I've been able to say that in a long time. Feels pretty good. Bless my soul. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 1. And let's take a look at a wonderful passage of Scripture. I don't know how, if you've had a lot of chance to uh, study the book of Hebrew, but I really, Hebrews, I really like this, this book of the Bible and like studying through it. So let's turn over there to Hebrews chapter 1. We'll read some verses here in part out of chapter 2, and uh, we'll take a look at what the Scripture tells us this evening. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in, and in various ways, diverse ways, your translation, the translation may say. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, so he became as much superior to the angels as the, uh, as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Uh, verses 1 and 2 here, the writer divides uh, he, he divides history into two sections or two segments or two ages before Christ and after Christ. He calls the time before Christ right there at the beginning in the past. During that time, God used the prophets uh, to reveal his message to the people. And, of course, the, the original Jewish readers of the book would have remembered and, and because they, they had studied all that. They had learned all those things uh, throughout their childhood, so they would have, they would have recognized that. Uh, uh, God had spoken to Isaiah in, in visions, uh, in Isaiah chapter 6 tells us that. Uh, to Jacob, he spoke to him in a dream. We see that in Genesis uh, chapter 28. God had spoke to Jeremiah through uh, object lessons, if you will, in Jeremiah chapter 13. And God had spoke to Abraham and Moses personally. We see that in the book of Genesis and Exodus. So then if you move on to verse 2, we see that the same God who spoke through the prophets uh, had now spoken through the giving of his son, through Jesus Christ. And so we break history uh, open into the second part when God's own son breaks from heaven, comes on, takes earthly flesh, and is here for a purpose and here uh, for a reason. Jesus uh, completed and fulfilled the scripture, fulfilled the old covenant, if you will, uh, fulfilled every, all the promises that were made in the, uh, in the Old Testament. And so in verse 5, through the remainder of the chapter, the writer continues by using passages of the Old Testament. It's a good read there if you want to go on. I don't have time to do that tonight. But to show the, the superiority of Jesus over the angels. And certainly we can look at Scripture, all through Scripture, and see the superiority of Jesus and the New Covenant over the Old Covenant in the Old Testament, right? So we, we see the Old Testament. It was there for a reason. We see the Old Testament give us the law there. It certainly well, well, it had its value, right? But the New Testament, the New Covenant, the New Promise was far superior to the Old Covenant, the Old Promise. So if you look, if you look over now to chapter 2 of, Hebrew, of Hebrews, chapter 2, uh, we see where the writer is going to make a very clear point. And watch this, chapter 2, verse 1. He says, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels, talking about Old Covenant, was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if, such, if we ignore such a great salvation. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him, who heard Jesus. 
God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So if you had a chance to think about it, you know, God's giving us this amazing salvation, this incredible new covenant, this New Testament where he comes and he fulfills all the promises made in the Old Testament all in one person. Jesus Christ, who was given to us by God alone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, that whosoever believeth in him shall not, but have everlasting life. That is an amazing thing. Everybody knows that scripture. Most everybody in this room could at least muddle through, if not quote it word for, uh, word, for word. And many of you could quote it in three different translations of the Bible. Amen? And yet, sometimes we neglect a great salvation, right? Let's pray and we'll talk about that more. Father, we come to you tonight. We just thank you that you've given us such great salvation, Lord. Lord, we, don't work, we, we didn't earn it. Uh, no way we can keep it. Lord, we couldn't work hard enough to get it in the first place. But Lord, because you loved us so much, you gave us your own son. Father, I pray that in our walk, we might show that we've not neglected that salvation. But instead, Lord, that we want to go out and we want to increase it in everything that we do. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, you know, if you had a chance to stop and think about your life in Christ, what would you want people to think about you? I'd want them to think I was a nice guy, you know, giving, unselfish. I'd want people to think that, uh, you know, that I love the Lord, that I walked in, in, in faith. And, you know, you know, you could just make a laundry list of things. You, you know, you, you, could, you could make a list. Your list may look a little, little different than mine, but we'd all have a list, wouldn't we? But then when you start thinking about, well, what should be on that list and what shouldn't be on that list, and all of a sudden you come to a clear conclusion that our list, no matter what it looked like, you could scratch all that out and just say, looks like Jesus. So that's the title of the sermon tonight, looks like Jesus. Jesus. First it was live like you mean it, but I like this sermon title better, so we're going to change it to that. How about that? So if you look at this, we, you know, if we want others to see Christ in others, in, in us, if you want Christ, others to see Christ in you, then you've got to be diligent in your study. You think about this. You know, we think we know what Jesus is like because we've been studying about him since, you know, we was a child. But how do you really know how Jesus is like if you don't know what the Bible says about Jesus? Now, we get these generalized ideas of what Christ is like, but whenever you start thinking about situationally, how should I act about when a certain thing happens? How should I respond in a certain way? Unless you have read and know about what Christ did in certain situations, the fact is you don't know. And what happens is when left without, without uh, knowledge of what to do, you do what you think. And remember that our mind is controlled by sin. Because in our spirit, we are objects of wrath. We have a sin nature. And so what comes out of us is directed by that unless it is overseen by and I guess maybe uh, uh, covered up by or done away with by Christ and the knowledge that we have in him. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. It says, we must... Not we need to, not we, it'd be a good idea. We must pay careful uh, attention, more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard. Listen, how many of you have been a Christian? How many of you in this, in this room been a Christian for more than 10 years? How many of you been a, watch this, how many of you been a Christian for more than 20 years? More than 30 years? More than 40 years? More than 50 years? More than 60 years. Finally. <laughs> Whew. Boy, I thought I was going to be in the old group for a minute there. <laughs> Sharon Craig was. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Isn't she pretty? Golly, she, she, she just, uh, she, you know what? She, now she's the cute little girl again, right? <laughs> so she lost a lot of dead weight. She's trying to get rid of John to lose some more dead weight, but that hadn't happened yet. But at any rate. But you know we, you know we've got to get in this. We've got to get into this book, and we we have to decide what Jesus looks like, 
how Jesus acted, and then we act like him. That seems so simple to me, doesn't it to you? But yet, we go on what we heard the preacher say, which could be right and could be wrong. <laughs> Hopefully it's all right. We go on what we've heard from other people, but the fact is, we need to dig into God's Word. There are so many commentaries, so many study books out there that tell us what to do in certain situations that go straight to God's Word. I'm telling you, I have got so many notes and all in the back of my Bible that I've taken from Sunday school. I love it when Derry writes stuff on the board. I, I, man, I'm telling you what, I write down every one of them. I'm about to run out of back pages in my Bible for writing down these things. But whenever situational things come or when somebody asks me a question about something specific, I don't have to say, well, I think. All I have to do is say, well, let me take a look here. Oh, yeah, I wrote that down. You know, if you turn over here to the book of Matthew, here's what it says right here. If you turn over here to the book of Romans, that's what it says right here. And you don't have to know or care what I think because you can look straight at God's word for yourself. And I'm going to tell you this. Woo, you're going to not like me for saying this. But you ought to know better. If we've been a Christian for as long as we've been a Christian, I'm just going to point four fingers at myself and only one at you and say we ought to know better, amen? Because we ought, to have been, we ought to have grown more in Christ so that when things situationally hit us, well, I know I should forgive them, but I'm just not going to. Well, what does the Bible say about that? Should I forgive a man seven times? No, I'll tell you how much. So you're not ignorant to the Word of God. It's, it's, it's not a knowledge problem, it's an application problem, right? Right? <laughs> Say it again. It's not a knowledge problem. It's an application problem, right? And so as Christians, as, as, as I'm telling you, the, the backbone, the foundation of this church, not the cornerstone because we know that's Jesus. Don't get me in trouble here. But as the people that ought to know the best, that ought to be mentors to everybody else, we got to set ourselves to a different level. If you believe that, say yes. If you know you need to do that, say amen. If you're going to say it, if you're going to do it, say praise the Lord. Because that's what we need to do, amen? Listen, I'm not trying to fuss at you. I'm just trying to tell you this. If we want to others to see Christ in us, then we've got to live like Christ. If we're going to live like Christ, then we've got to know how Christ lived. If we're going to, have to, if we're going to know how Christ lived, then we've got to get in our Bible and we've got to study that thing so that we can show ourselves approved. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Study this book of instruction once a month. It doesn't say that. You got it up, Mark? Yeah, what does it say? Continually. You know, it even says that. In, in, in every translation, it's got some word like that. But it's talking about all the time. Meditate on it. In other words, think on it. Day and night. Why? So that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Can I tell you that it's not too difficult to do that Whenever you're at, at you know, at, at um, women's retreat or men's retreat, n not too hard in youth camp or, or in, in some church thing going on, not too hard then, is it? When it's hard is when you're the only one doing it, right? It's hard when you're the only one doing it. Number two, if we want, to see other, if we want others to see Christ in us, not only what, must we be diligent in our study, we must be diligent in our service in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 let's go back to that passage it says we must pay more careful attention therefore to what we have heard so that we don't drift away so that we do not drift away it's 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 listen it's and, and I'm telling you I, I know this in my own life so I'm just I'm just stomping on my toes tonight while I'm stomping on y'all's but but it's not that we don't know what God's word says we have to put it into action Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Wow, the Bible can do all that? Yes. We need to understand that it is not okay for us to take time off from being in God's service. We need to constantly 
be on guard. I, I went over to see uh, Vernon and Vida this week. Thank the Lord they're letting me keep some trailers over there for a while until we get all set up. But we went inside the house there and we were talking about this, this dear lady, Miss Thelma Jennings, and, and having a hard time. And boy, just, I mean, just a tough situation. And, and I looked at Miss, Miss uh, Vida and, and, and uh, Vernon. I said, you know, isn't it good to know that God's not done with you yet? I said, you know, I was talking to Kim the other day, and she says, you know, I, I love going over there because every time I go over there, I feel the Spirit of the Lord there. I just feel the Spirit of God all over that place. Why? Because they hadn't took off. They hadn't retired. When are you going to retire from being a Christian? I'm not. I, don't, I hope I don't. I hope I don't retire from being a Christian. There's a lot of things that I, I wouldn't mind retiring from, but, but you know what? Not from serving God because God doesn't get through with you He's just going to usher you on up into the playground of heaven, right? It takes a lifetime to make a good reputation and just a moment to lose it. You know, when you let your guard down and somebody gets on your last nerve and you stomp them on the toe verbally, <laughs> you know what? You'll lose the reputation that you've got that you worked so hard to get. When others look at us and at our church, they need to see Christ in us. Can I just, can I just make a side point for a second here? How many of you know that we had a bunch of visitors in church this morning? And, and, and That's right, we had a bunch. And there was a couple that came through the back door there. I was handing out the little things for moms. I said, are you a mom? I'd like to give this to you. I said, I don't recognize you. Is this your first time here? Yes. And they told me their names. And I said, man, thank you for being here. Can I have to find a seat? Because everybody was rolling in. And, and I was trying to get them through the crowd, through the back there over to a seat. I couldn't get them through for people saying, glad to see you, glad you're here. What's your name? <laughs> This made me feel good because I know that you don't just say you love people. You really do. And you're willing to show it. In you. Listen, the time that we take off from showing people that we love them is the moment that God takes his blessing off this church. And the moment that God takes his blessing off this church is the moment that this church has nothing to offer. Amen? And so I'm just saying that if we want others to see Christ in us, then we got to look like Christ. <laughs> Does that make sense? Is that simple enough for, for me? I mean, if, if we want others to see Christ in us, then we got to have Christ coming out of every pore of us. And, and I just love the, 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 the verse in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is God-breathed. And it's useful. Watch this. It's useful for teaching. It is. It's useful for teaching us because we need to know how to act. It's useful for rebuking us. <laughs> for, ne for, for slapping us on the back of the neck and saying you don't need to act that way it, it's, it's useful for correcting for making us have turns in the way that we're going if, we're, if our path is an incorrect path then the Bible is the place that we need to be looking at to go down the correct path isn't that right kids? young people, students what am I supposed to call you these days? Hey. Da, 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 da. Oh. is that Harold? I did that during a wedding not too awful long ago. Teach you to keep your phone on. I'll make fun of you. <laughs> training in righteousness. Huh? Guys, we need training in righteousness, don't we? It doesn't come naturally to us. But when we're trained up in righteousness, it just comes back out and it just it just expands and swells. My word, woman! Everybody give her a round of applause right there. Yeah. Boy, Harold, if you don't turn that fuck, if you don't quit calling her, I'm fixing to come up there. <laughs> Watch this. Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, the Bible tells us that Paul and Barnabas were teaching 